As more and more adaptive personalized learning solutions enter the market, educators in schools are increasingly looking to use them to augment their instruction. The subject of reading is seen by many as an area that could benefit substantially from this technology. In a study published earlier this summer, researchers from the University of Cincinnati and North Carolina State University Raleigh looked into the MindPlay Virtual Reading Coach. That's an adaptive reading supplement offered by the company MindPlay. And the researchers investigated its use in three separate Midwestern districts where students, like most American learners, were often one or more grade levels behind in literacy and reading skills. While the researchers found MindPlay significantly outperformed traditional instruction and other reading tools to improve literacy, none of the teachers using it wanted to continue to do so once the trial was over. The findings indicate that there's much more to edtech than academic outcomes. Hi, my name is Henry Kronk for eLearning Inside. This is Ed Technically. This week, I'm going to play segments of the interview I did with Professor Heidi Kluse from the University of Cincinnati, who was the lead author on the study. Professor Kluse is a professor of psychology, and she has a lot of interesting things to say about how people learn and how technology fits into the picture. So this interview is cut up from what initially took place. The sound quality isn't amazing. I think you hear a siren going by in the background at one point. For a really basic summary of the study, we'll, we'll get into it much more in the conversation, but essentially, Kluse and her team tested the use of this uh, adaptive learning courseware uh, offered by MindPlay at three different districts. The main focus of the study, uh, because this is how MindPlay is designed, was to study the p specific skill of reading fluency, which pretty much means how fast people read. People need to be able to read at a certain speed in order to connect the meaning of words together in a sentence. Uh, if you get hung up and you're going word to word, it's harder to do so. So it's kind of an essential skill that's required. Um, it's also not the entire picture of uh, literacy by any stretch of the imagination. There's much more to it than this. But yeah, for a TLDR about the study, MindPlay was shown to significantly improve reading fluency uh, compared to traditional instruction. But the teacher still didn't want to use it, and uh, Professor Kluse has a lot to say about why that might be, and uh, a lot more detail there. Also, this did not make it into the cut, but Kluse wanted to reinforce the fact that the teachers who were using this were very experienced and, in her view, uh, very competent teachers. Uh, I think it's pretty easy to read the conclusions of this study as it being a case of teachers just not uh, having the experience to use a tool like this. Professor Kluse was very uh, firm in uh, underlining the fact that these teachers were on top of their game, they knew how to manage a classroom, and that uh, it was simply not a factor in the study. So I'm just going to play sections of the study um, for a fuller picture of how things went. I invite any listener to read the full uh, article published in eLearning Inside. And for even more detail, you can access the study at uh, Frontiers in Education, which is an online open access academic journal. And links to everything are available in the description and also via eLearning Inside. So here it, here it is. Here's Professor Heidi Kluse talking about her latest research on the reading coach offered by MindPlay. So my 
background is in how the mind works and how children learn on a kind of more basic level. So some of those research you'll see is like uncomprehensible because it has to do with how the mind works and how we build, you know, knowledge. Um, but then more recently, I got involved with more directly related to school learning. Um, and it was actually as part of math learning. Turns out it's really hard for the mind to learn math. And so I started to switch more to academic knowledge, math learning. And in that context, I assumed wrongly that surely we have solved the reading problem. And so I wanted to write this paper, and I actually did, it was also published in Frontiers, where we make this argument that the reading has been kind of solved. Because, you know, we all know we need practice, we need to be exposed to reading. And that's, you know, half the battle. Um, anyways, and so when you dig a little deeper, you realize the proficiency rates nationally are just as bad, especially for low income schools, which is the schools we work with. So that took me by surprise, and I dug into that, and I work with some people who are more connected to the schools than I am, and they brought MindPlay to my attention. They'd be like, you know, I wonder if you're ever interested in looking at this program. So, in other words, the, the way to MindPlay wasn't directly a fit, it wasn't even my primary interest. My primary interest is the mind, and then I went to math, and realizing that reading is also a struggle and then a, a friend of mine who works with schools brought up this point of hey we have the success with mindset you might look into it and so i said sure mm-hmm. so we did cool that's and that's really interesting to me because a lot of other adaptive personalized learning like uh, algorithm uh, ai based uh, courseware like that is targeted at math instruction too, right? Like those, right, those are right, the, kind of the right. two uh, fields where people are saying this really works. Um, have you have you investigated a similar uh, software for math instruction? Yeah, so we're working with technology and math is not similar. Math is way more complicated. We're we're right now doing a research study with a program called Ascend, and we found just horrible results. Kids hate it and. So we're at the beginning still, but also it's also focused on technology. The idea being that there has to be something more adaptive to help with learning um, rather than a teacher instructing a classroom independently of the children's level. So we've worked with in technology with IXL, but also Ascend, as I now mentioned. But even then, I can I, I can tell you it's not going to be a quick turnaround research like it was with, with reading because math is, is definitely far more challenging and um, for the mind to learn. And if you skip something, it's not as easy as, oh, let me show it to you again. Sometimes it's years of neglect that have to somehow be made up mm-hmm. to catch kids up. So reading, I, I mean, look, you didn't ask this, but it's kind of interesting to me too, to find that reading, that kids struggle with reading. And that if you look at, trajectories over time um these national trajectories that people put out there's no movement kids are struggling to read like just reading fluency they're not reading at the level of their grade um where it's not that hard to, for the mind to learn where where does that fall apart so it gets into this whole issue of how are our schools stru- structured and how does technology fit into a learning environment and then we bring this technology in that we heard works really well and it works really well and then we find the teachers don't like it what i mean you know it just tells you right there we have big we have really big problems when it comes to education and technology and this is the last thing i say and then i'll done be done with the rant when I mean, technology is very timely and very well developed and very much in line with insights about how the mind works but it's an uphill battle to make technology work within a classroom setting, even good technology like MindPlay. So, yeah. so we we are we feel like we're at the bottom of a hill here and still have have lots of ways to go just to even find out where teachers are coming from or why why something that's clearly working doesn't seem to easily fit into somebody's day. Right. So your turn. Okay, I wanted to talk about 
the idea that you raised, kind of the debate um, that you raised in the introduction about um, improving literacy as a function of adding more skills or for students acquiring either more skills or having the motivation uh, right. to do so. Is there, right. is there a side that you fall on in that debate? Um, you know, you're asking these really simple questions that I wish they sound like yes, no question. I wish I could just say, here's my side. Um, oh, no, I'm sorry. It's, <laughs> it's very complicated stuff. It, it is, unfortunately. Um, ideally, the ideal learning environment combines both. Yeah, it's kind of obvious. You need the skills and you need the drive and the motivation and the right goals and the right support to strengthen the skills so that it be more motivating. So it, it's a whole system that has to work well together. In fact, I would say having these sides as competing against each other is probably hurting the conversation. I was surprised to see how much research would say, oh, see, it's in motivation, not the skill. Or, oh, no, the skills lead to motivation. I mean, obviously, those two things are related. You can yeah. have amazing skills and be completely unmotivated to use them, and then you'll lose the skills, even if you had them at one point and they were great. But just motivation is not going to get you there either. You need the skills of these, these elementary skills. You need the practice. You need, you need the boring stuff too. And, and if we can find a way to combine the two, and I, I don't mean this to be rhetorical. I honestly don't know yet the way to combine those two. Um, in a, in a kind of a way that you can package it and give it to a, a teacher, I think we wouldn't have reading problems anymore. Good teachers already do that. They know how to motivate their kids to learn the skills to gain more motivation. And then everybody else falls on one side or the other and spends their time proving that their side is right. You know, teachers aside, based on your okay. research, and if somebody was considering using this, you know, in, okay. in kind of okay. like speaking plainly, maybe how would you sure. how do you present uh, what your findings? Okay, so we actually had to do that because I, I we work with other schools, and so we do talk to parents and teachers, and and here's what I say to them: They say we have this pro program that works surprisingly well to improve a child's reading fluency. So that's the speed at which people can read. And it's crucial to read at a certain speed. So this product can help with that. I'm pretty convinced from the data we saw that it's very good at improving a child's reading fluency. But at the same time, we did run into some um, difficulties and it's described in the paper as under limitations. And one of them was that teachers were somewhat um, I don't know how to put it well, but, but they were hesitant, that they had some concerns about the program. And while we don't have more information about it, it's possible that the kids just didn't like it as much, that there wasn't, it, it doesn't, it doesn't give the kids any choices. There's no conversation about the readings or writing about it or thinking about it. It's, it's, and this is literally how I describe it to the parents. It's like going into a tunnel and keep walking, and on the way out, you will read faster. But it's not a pleasant, necessarily, experience. And so when we when we give this product to parents or, or kids who struggle with, we make sure we tell the parents, you know, keep a close eye, maybe work with your kid, maybe come up with some reward systems that you and your child is familiar with. It is not a f surefire thing in terms of motivational aspects. It will increase your fluency, or the kid's fluency, if you can use it if you can make it through those dull moments and keep going and do it for 30 minutes a day it will increase fluency and that is part of an important battle to begin enjoying reading so correct me if i'm wrong at any point here but you know i i do read a fair amount of research on how well ed tech works Okay. And there seems to be a consensus to me uh, among academics who, 
who study these and write this that if we can present uh, measurable data that you know this thing improves learning outcomes then that's like a pretty good way of determining whether or not a school or a district or a classroom should use it uh, how would you how would you respond to to this and and do you think that uh, you know these measuring these outcomes is uh, a good way of determining efficacy so so you know I'm I'm like we said earlier, I'm a little bit out of, outside of the the reading um, research that you are probably most familiar with, the, the kind of reading in school. I publish some things on reading of how the mind works, but not, not the kind of day-to-day -day school work. So I don't know all this research. Um, I know, though, that funding requires proof of outcome, just like I did, you know, an experiment with rigorous measures of showing that it works. They have this whole what works clearing house. Uh, it's a lot of money that taxpayer pay to make all that work. And the assumption is that if I can show you that something works, surely all you have to do is turn on the button and it will work. And I, I have to say that is definitely naive. That idea that if you give me something that works like a pill, all I have to do is swallow it. Maybe it works with medical stuff if the swallowing is easy enough. But in education, I don't see that working because it takes more effort than just to swallow a pill. Sitting in front of a computer for 30 minutes a day is not fun. And so you absolutely need to buy in from everybody, the kids, the teachers, the parents, the community, the superintendent, everybody. And the more you have that, the more you see success. And if you don't have it, and we've worked with some schools that just didn't buy into it, you can bring, you know, an angel himself, and it will not work. So, so definitely by the course of this research, but also before I was wondering, and now I'm pretty convinced that you do need that kind of social cultural context to be positive for technology to work. Why that is, I don't know. This has been Ed Technically. My name is Henry Kronk, and I work as the editor at eLearning Inside. If you like this episode, please rate and review. If you would like to hear more, please subscribe. Also, please keep in mind that this show is available as a video on our YouTube channel and also as a podcast on iTunes and Stitcher. The basic content for this video first appeared as an article on eLearning Inside, and if you'd like to hear more about online courses, technology in the classroom, and ed tech in general, please check out our site. If you'd like to get in touch with me, please send an email to henry at elearninginside.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at elearninginside. Thanks for listening.